Hi, it's Kemgal, and in this video, we're going to go over electrophilic addition of bromine to an alkene. So let's get started by drawing the mechanism. Here I have laid out for you an alkene as well as a Br2 molecule. And we know that the best way to start off a mechanism is by asking ourselves who's going to be the nucleophile and who's going to be the electrophile. From the previous videos, we know that an alkene is a really good nucleophile because it can break its double bond and donate that as electron density. Therefore, our Br2 molecule is going to act as our electrophile. So we can draw an arrow going from the double bond on the alkene over to the bromine. Remember that the arrow shows the flow of electron density. So this alkene is handing over its electron density and that's what makes it a very good nucleophile. But now, something a little strange happens in this mechanism. We form something called a bridge bromonium ion. And in order for this to form, the bromine must simultaneously attack the alkene while this other bromine leaves. As a recap, this first arrow indicates that the double bond is going to break and be used to form this new bond with the bromine. This second arrow indicates that bromine is going to use its lone pair to form a new bond with this carbon on the right. And that's why this bromine atom only has two lone pairs. It lost one in making that bond. This last arrow indicates that this bromine is going to leave, and when it does, it's going to take a new lone pair from this broken bond and form right over here. So we see that bromine initially had three lone pairs, but it gained one from the breakage of that bond. So now it has four. And that makes sense because we know that each bond is equivalent to two electrons or one lone pair. So now we can recalculate the formal charges for both of these bromines over here. So formal charge is going to be equal to valence electrons minus surrounding electrons. We know that bromine has seven valence electrons because it's a halogen. And surrounding this bromine right now is one, two, three, four, and one from each bond, which makes for a total of six surrounding electrons and a total charge of positive one. And that makes sense because we called this a bridged bromonium ion and a little tip for you is that when things end in em it tends to mean that they have a positive charge which is actually placed right here on the bromine and if we calculate the formal charge for this bromide over here it's going to be equal to seven valence electrons while surrounding it right now is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 7 minus 8 is going to be a charge of negative 1. So this bromide ion has a charge of negative 1. Now that we've successfully recalculated our charges, we need to reassess who will be our nucleophile and who will be our electrophile in this next step of the reaction. We know that nucleophilic things tend to be negatively charged, and electrophilic things tend to be positively charged. So this guy is going to act as our nucleophile, while this guy is going to act as our electrophile. And I've just abbreviated those for you. So we have to draw an arrow that shows that this bromide ion is going to connect to one of these two carbons. But which carbon is going to attach to? Is it going to attach to this carbon, which is more substituted? or this carbon, which is less substituted? The answer is that bromine is going to use one of its lone pairs to attach to that more substituted carbon. But we gotta remember that this carbon here already has four bonds, and we can't give it a fifth bond or else we'd break the octet rule. So what we have to do is break that bond between this carbon and bromine. And so you might be asking yourself, well, why did it attack this carbon? If this carbon is more substituted, doesn't that mean it's more hindered? 
But the reason why it attacks this carbon is because we say that birch bromonium ions have something called carbocation-like characteristics. To understand this, I want you to imagine that we had the option of throwing a positive charge on one of these two carbons. Where would the positive charge be happiest? We know that the positive charge would be happiest on the more substituted carbon. Remember that the stability goes from primary to secondary to tertiary stabilized carbons. Therefore, our carbocation would be most stable if it's on the more substituted carbon. Therefore, this carbon is going to be more delta positive, which means that it's more susceptible to being attacked by a nucleophile because it is more electrophilic. So as a recap, this bridge bromonium ion is not a carbocation. However, it has carbocation-like characteristics. Now let's draw out our products. We know that we are forming a bond here between bromine and carbon. So we can imagine that it's going to come in and attach to this carbon over here. And so this bond here between carbon and bromine is going to break. So we can't draw that in anymore. However, this bond stays intact, so we can draw it in over here. As a recap, this shows the new bond we formed between carbon and bromide. While this bond is what's remaining between this carbon and this bromine atom here, since this bond had broken. And so when this bond broke, it turned into a lone pair on this bromine atom. So now this bromine atom is going to have three lone pairs. And this bromide used its lone pair to form that new bond between it and carbon. So now it only has three lone pairs left. So if we wanted to go ahead and recalculate the formal charges for these bromine atoms, we know that it would be exactly the same because both of them have three lone pairs and one bond. So let's go ahead and do that. The formal charge is equal to valence electrons minus surrounding electrons. We know that bromine has seven valence electrons and surrounding it right now is one, two, three, four, five, six, and one from the bond, which makes for a total surrounding electrons of seven and a total charge of zero. So these bromines are both neutral. We have a special name for this step of the reaction. We actually call this backside attack. And in order for you to understand this, it's important to remember that these bonds are not just in the plane of the page and that they are actually 3D rotating around the structure. We also have to remember that there's a hydrogen over here that we just haven't drawn in at every step of the way. So if we wanted to see what this intermediate really looked like, we can draw it out like this. So here I have drawn for you an accurate representation of what our bridge bromonium ion would look like in 3D. And if it makes you feel more comfortable, you can draw out these methyl groups as CH3 groups. And so it makes sense that the bromine is attached to both of these carbons in one direction. So it's either going to be in the plane of the page or pointing out at you on wedges or into the page on dashes. So when this bromide ion comes into attack, it's going to come from the unoccupied side and form what we call anti-products, which look like this. Such that the bromines are going to be anti to each other or opposite. And that's the product of this backside attack that we have over here. As a recap, whenever you have electrophilic addition of bromine to an alkene, all that's going to happen is this double bond is going to break and in its place you're going to have both these bromine atoms attaching in an anti form. Now let's go ahead and try some examples. So here I have some examples laid out for you. And we're going to go ahead and do the first one together so that you can try the rest on your own.
So remember we said that whenever we're adding Br2 to an alkene, this double bond here is going to break. And in place of that double bond on those two carbons over here, we're going to add bromines in an anti position. So what would our answer look like? If we draw out our answer, we know that the double bond is going to disappear and that we're going to have two bromines in different positions. And the easiest way to do this is to draw one of the bromines on a wedge and the other one on a dash. If we take a minute to think about what our intermediate looked like, our intermediate probably looked like this. This right here would be our bridge bromonium ion, and that would give rise to this product. But now, what if our bridge bromonium ion looked like this? In that case, our product would look like this. So now we've got to ask ourselves the big question. What's the relationship between this guy and this guy? Are they different? Are they the same? Are they equally likely to form? And the answer is, these two are actually the same exact compound. I'll do a separate video explaining on why that is. But for now, you can know that there's a plane of symmetry here. And that makes these guys a meso compound. So because these two are the same, we only need to draw it once. And so we can go ahead and erase this guy over here. Now, take a moment to try number two on your own. Remember that the double bond is going to disappear. And on those two carbons, we're going to go ahead and draw one bromine on a wedge and one on a dash. And that might be what the product would look like if you had this sort of intermediate. But now, what if your intermediate looked like this? Would we get a different product? Let's see. Our product would then look like this. And that's because when the Br- minus comes in, in this case scenario, it's going to come in and attack on the opposite side. So it's going to come in from the wedge side. And so now we got to ask ourselves a big question again. What's the relationship between these two compounds here? Are they different? Are they the same? Are they enantiomers? And the answer is here that these guys are going to be enantiomers. And an easy way to tell is by drawing a dashed line in the middle. And you can see that these two compounds are exact mirror images of each other. And remember that mirror images of each other means that they are going to be enantiomers. And so these two compounds are equally likely to form. So it's a racemic mixture. Therefore, we must draw both of these compounds in our answers. Now, take a moment to try the third one on your own. And silly me, I forgot to draw bromine in over here. So it's the same deal here. We draw our cyclopentene and we remove the double bond. And then in this case, we're going to add bromine in two positions. So we can either add bromine like this or like this. And so now we got to ask ourselves, what's the relationship between these two? And these two guys are actually going to be enantiomers of each other. And you might be like, well, hold up. Why are these enantiomers? They're not mirror images of each other. Well, if you actually turn this guy around over here, he would actually be the mirror image of that guy. So let's go ahead and bring this guy down over here and turn him around 180 degrees so we can see what it would look like. If we did that, our cyclopentane ring would show up over here and our chain would show up over here. Now, our bromines would look like this.
And let me move this over a little bit so we can compare. The reason why this bromine changed from a wedge to a dash is because initially it was pointing into the page away from you, but when we turned the structure around, it began to face you. It makes sense. Imagine anything. If you hold a pencil up to your face right now and point it towards your face, and then you swing it around 180 degrees, now that pencil is going to be pointing away from you. And that's why this bromine changed from being on a dash to a wedge. Likewise, for this bromine, it was facing toward you, but because we rotated the structure 180 degrees, now it's going to be facing away from you. And so these two compounds are exactly the same, just rotated about an axis. So now if we put this structure side by side, with this structure, we can see that they are exact mirror images of each other. Remember that enantiomers are exact mirror images of each other that are non-superimposable. And because these two guys are exact mirror images of each other, they are therefore enantiomers. I'll just erase that mirror image that I drew. And I'll swing this guy back up here. And now we know that these two guys are enantiomers of each other. We just had to rotate this guy around to see that they were mirror images. And so we have to draw both products in our answers in order to get full credit. On to our next example. And I'm so silly because I have forgotten to draw here our double bond. So it's the same deal. We know that we're going to form a cyclohexane ring and that the double bond here is going to break so that we can attach two bromines, one on this carbon and one on this carbon. And if we do that, we're going to get one on a dash and one on a wedge. And now you might be asking yourself, well, can't I also form this structure? And that's true, you can form this structure. So now we gotta ask ourselves, what's the relationship between these two compounds? And if we wanted to, we can actually rotate this compound. And I'm gonna do this in front of you. We can rotate this compound here. And I'm just going to redraw these bromines right side up here so it doesn't get too confusing. We have bromine here and bromine here. Now we can see that these two are the exact mirror images of each other, and therefore they are enantiomers. That means that we must draw both of these compounds in our answer choices. And it's okay if you draw it like this, or even if you rotate it back to what it originally looked like, it doesn't matter because it's still going to be the same compound. So all you need to do is draw both of these in your answer choices. Stay tuned for the next video if you want to find out why the products of number one were miso and why the products for number two turned out to be enantiomers. I'll be providing an in-depth explanation. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, please leave a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe. Happy studying!